Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. That's not going to happen tonight, but we thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to introduce Seth McFarland and Joe McNeely. Who, who got the idea that they were so in love with Christmas? And how drunk was one of... <laughs> I, I got really liquored up and converted to Christianity and then sobered up and it went away. Um, I, uh, you know, we, we, had done, we had done the first album, Music is Better Than Words, and um, the, the record label suggested, hey, you know, if you want to do another one of these, a Christmas record might be a good fit, and it was something that hadn't occurred to either of us, I think. Um, but it... it, it seemed like thematically something that might be kind of fun, so we ran with it, and this is what we came up with. So it was, it was kind of a mutual thing, or which one of you, did you go to Joel and say, yeah, come on, we'll do it? Or did he come to you and say, we need to do it? I don't remember, do you? No, so neither of us a, remember. There was a lot of alcohol involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but it turned out so well, so that's... We, okay. we were happy, we're happy with the way it turned out. Yeah. yeah. So the reason behind it is that you're in love with those songs or you're in love with something else behind the songs? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't, you, you have to speak for yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, an avid fan of Christmas music necessarily. Scrooge, my father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. It's well. just, it was just me and my cat this year, man. But um, but I, I do you know I love the the genre of orchestral jazz which is so closely linked to so much Christmas music, um, so it, it it was not a big leap. Um, but we you know we we did try to pick stuff that was not quite as done as uh, as albums that we've we've heard before. You know we we've heard White Christmas and Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and these songs a thousand times before. It's like singing Come Fly With Me. You're not going to do it better than Sinatra, so why try? Um, it, it's, so we, we, we picked a few songs that you know, people will know, and then some other songs that, that are kind of undiscovered gems, we hope. And that's half the fun, is, is, is ideally being the first person in, in, in years to try and interpret something that's been forgotten and to reinvent it. What's one of those songs that are forgotten? I, on Christmas Dreaming, I know, is one of them. Well, that was one that you found. Christmas Dreaming. Yeah, Christmas Dreaming is a really obscure song. In fact, we could only find one recording of it, which was Sinatra, right? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that guy. Yeah. So but I mean, it was, a very early, <laughs> it was a very early recording, and I don't, I, I don't, I'm not aware that, that anybody else has recorded it. I'm sure they have, but we couldn't find it. Mm. Well, I think we should hear one of the songs. What was it that you would like to hear right now? I don't know. You know, I said you could pick them. I don't, I don't give right. a shit. All right, well, I want to start because it's, yeah, I'll just pick them, even ones that aren't on the album. You know, I'll just say, you know. You can play whatever it, you want. You know, I noticed that this album does not have a lot of You can play the, the Carpenter's songs. Top of the World if you want right now. I'm not going to stop you. How did you know I was? <laughs> Do you you, no, actually, like, you actually like the Carpenters? No, I, I love the Carpenters. Carpenters. See, there's confessions tonight that you're hearing all of this. No, I would be, for my own odd, bizarre, twisted reasons, I would like to hear a little of uh, Baby It's Cold Outside. Sure. That you duet with Sarah Bareilles. With Sarah Bareilles, yes. yeah. yeah. In fact, we're doing it live right now at the uh, Christmas tree lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Which, How's that going? Brilliant bit of scheduling. Wow. <laughs> oh, good. That's Can set your DVRs. Yes, Peter, you can only stare into my eyes for so long while this is happening. Just like my mother ice. will start to worry. Just three guys What's sitting on a stage silently listening to Christmas music. To the fireplace and there's nothing the wrong with that. Don't Any, anyway, <laughs> you know, they get to go home tomorrow. So they're in a relaxed, mellow mood. You know, you, you don't get to go home? I get to go home, but I live here. Do you not want to go home? Is there, is there trouble at home? You pe never. <laughs> In New York, there's this only good. If you, if you go and watch the lighting of the tree tonight, you will be pummeled and pushed and, you know, all kinds of non-Christmassy things. Um, 
What was the question? I don't remember. I know there was a big call for Melakaliki Maka, oh, right, which is yeah. the Hawaiian way the Hawaiian to Christmas say song. Merry Christmas yeah. to you. Joel, was I musical when I said that? This is, by the way, this is a great... I say this often. The art of orchestration is something that is, is vanishing or vanished. And by, by that I mean, <clears throat> if you listen to a Sinatra song because nobody had better arrangers than he did, and you pull the vocals out of that, you still hear this awesome orchestral track. There's a lot going on with the orchestra, and, and that's become something that's very dull nowadays. And one of the things that Joel is, can do, and I think he's one of like five guys left who can do it, is really command an orchestra so that there's fun... There's jokes in the arrangements. There's fun stuff going on. He's got a Hawaiian guitar in there. And that's, that's something that I would love to hear more of, and, and we just don't get enough of it. So this is a good example of that done well by this guy. Well, we should say, too, that you recorded this live with the orchestra. This isn't done. And you were with real human breathing musicians? Well, we did it. It's the second album that we've done that way. Yeah, real, actually, yeah, yeah with about 60 musicians. And we, we wanted to do it the way that they did it. 50 years ago, where your prep is done before you record and not in post-production, where you'd spend three days recording the album. What you do in the studio is what's on the record. You, you, you do it with the orchestra, so everyone is in the same room, breathing the same air, and, and you kind of feed off of each other. And it just makes a huge difference. Yeah, and there's, there's no isolation, right? There's nobody in a booth. The drums are sitting next to the violin, so everything's leaking in all the mics, which is a part of the old sound. One thing I wanted to say about the recording of this, though, is it was done in uh, Abbey Road Studios in London in Studio 2, which is, for me, holy ground. You genuflect when you walk through those doors because that's where about 95% of all the Beatles songs were recorded. And the room has not changed since the, the days that the Beatles recorded there. So it's a very special place. The vibe is really, really great. So because you're dealing with Seth, while this is happening, is he dictatorial when he's in there, or does he listen to you at all? Since you did arrange everything, are there points during the process where he says, who the hell came up with this? I can't sing this. We have those moments yeah. ahead of time. I, see. I do these arrangements, and we, we figure these things out together. Um, we come up, a lot of times he'll come up with a concept for a tempo or a style for the song. Um, and then in the case of Melakaliki Maka, which is, I, my day job is film music, and uh, I was writing this arrangement, and I just had this kind of daydream about walking through a jungle. Everything's murky and creepy, and suddenly you come into a clearing, and there's a, this luau going on with all these people bouncing around in the, <laughs> in the grass skirts and whatnot. And so I made that... Uh, a part of the story of the arrangement. You, you hear that story in, in the arrangement. It makes no sense whatsoever other, uh, other, other than it amused me while I was well, working. Uh, so and and, and pa pa part of it, too, is connecting. You know, we also start on the same page. So part of it is, is you know, it's like a casting process. It's like you want to be working with someone who's already who already kind of gets the things already that you get. Who knows your craziness. And, you know, as, as Joel and I have talked about, you know, we live in an age where everything has to be mocked up with a synthesizer for the producer to hear and and Joel wrote this amazing score for a million ways to die in the west and you know we again we did it the old fashioned way where he gets the film he writes the music and then we go and we hear it with the orchestra the first time when it's being recorded so you can't you know which is unprecedented and, doesn't happen anymore the level of trust you know, um, just allowing a composer to write. He says, I trust you, I'll hear it at the session. That never happens. And it was very freeing, very freeing as a composer. I, I bet it would be. And it, it's also liberating when you, well, we should hear it. We should hear a little bit of Melikaliki Maka, especially with Joel's very strange daydreams, <laughs> so that we can experience them with you in the room. If, if you listen to Joel's instrumental break in the middle, it's what we're talking about. Yeah, this, yeah. I was thinking of a guy tap dancing.
So there's a lot going on. A lot going on there. And that's it's just like it's just it's just kind of a ballsy, fun <clears throat> sound that you don't hear anymore. And again, he's he's awesome, this guy. He is. But this is also called Holiday for Swing. And it does. It has a real I don't expect to hear that kind of arrangement on this, which is what's so refreshing about it. You get to you really hear that. Yeah, well you hear I mean if if you listen to the to the capital arrangements on the old Sinatra records, you're hearing xylophones. You're hearing stuff that's light and, and buoyant and, and, you know, it, it kind of mixes itself. Um, and and it, it's, it's fun. It's fun stuff. It's like not afraid to be funny and whimsical at times. And, and I think that's what you don't see a lot of now. And touching. Now, Joel, when, at what point did you cry hearing him sing? <laughs> Well, that's kind of between me and him. I know, you, you <laughs> and I know it yeah, happened. No, I, mean, I want to I kind of comment on what Seth just said about the, these arrangements. What the fun thing is, is that we're both starting from the same point of a love for this, this music of that time. And Seth is a real connoisseur, really knows the music, um, knows it better than I do for sure. And so we're already kind of... This is the pool we're going to swim in. These, the, these are the colors we're going to use. That's We were both in the pool. That's when you cried. Yes. Uh. <laughs> and, um, and, and so it just makes it easy because we know what the confines are. And, and He's a very knowledgeable dude about this music. But it sounds like you two are having the really best time in, <laughs> in every road doing this. And... How do you separate yourself from having this good time to listening back to it and saying, is this, is this coming across what we were feeling? It's, it's, two, it's two separate parts of your brain. And, you know, I, for example, you know, when I record Family Guy, do you and do I go that? back to, I do yeah. occasionally, <laughs> I still do it. Um, you know, there's a part of the brain that is at work when you're performing, and then that part switches off and another part lights up when you're listening back. And you almost get to the point where you're able to treat it as though you're hearing another person. Um, and it just becomes habit. So that, that's something that is, is certainly easier to do on a, on a record because there's a much, you know, there's a bigger space of time between when you record it and when you listen back for the first time. But Well, people will also notice when they're listening to it and I'm, I'm sure they're all getting it now that CD or they're just foolish they're getting it they're getting it now but they will notice that there is no song sung by uh, Ted or by Stewie or by any of those other characters is this a conscious decision on your part yeah I mean you know <laughs> they keep it pure aren't you yeah well, you know th this all came about when you know I had done a, a live special uh, on Fox with Alex Borstein, who does Lois, Son Family Guy. And it, it was, you know, it was like a combination music sketch. It was like a one-off. We did, we did one of them. And we had, we had a live orchestra there on stage. And, and Universal Republic Records said, hey, this was fun. Would you want to do a record of some kind? And they kind of left it up to me. They said, they said anything you want to do, we'll do it. And, and I said, well, you know, I've done, I, I'm, I'm up to my ass in comedy. So... I'd like to do something like this. This is this is another love of mine. I love classic orchestral arrangements. I love this genre of music. It's just an era of high musicality that's unmatched to this day. And they astonishingly said, "All right, go ahead." And we recorded that first album in uh, in Capital A, which is where Sinatra recorded a lot of his stuff. We used his mic. You know, it's still in existence. It's, it's history there, but I just keep thinking that late at night, or I don't know how many days you were actually recording that, that he, Joel, you would know this, that he snuck over to the mic and, you know, did White Christmas as sung by Ted. He never did it. He stayed pure. You know, I, we took this as, a, you know, a very serious project, and it was very honest. We were coming at it from a from a standpoint of wanting to be true to the music and get it as um, authentic as possible. To that end, we, we recorded live to analog tape. Um, that's a very different sound, the way they used to record it. And it's, you know, it's, it's even difficult now to buy analog tape. There are only a few factories in the world that actually manufacture this stuff. 
but we did it live to tape, and we had complete performances from the orchestra instead of the security that studio players have. Well, we'll fix it if there's any problems. We'll punch in here, we'll do that, we'll layer it over. This was a performance, so there was a level of commitment from the players who were on the edge of their chairs because they knew if they screwed up in the last four bars and missed the trumpets missed the last high C or something, we all went back to the beginning and started over. And that made this kind of collective energy where everyone was really on it. Uh, except for the, the guy or the woman who screwed up. You know, if you got through most of it and then somebody made that mistake. How many musicians were you working with there? It was about 55, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and they're all the same players that, that play on Family Guy and American Dad every week. I mean, there's, they're studio musicians who just do this every day. And, I mean, they're, they're, it always seems to me that, that, that the, the more I, I deal with those people, the, I was thinking to myself, you know, the, the most famous trumpet player or clarinet player or what have you, whatever instrument you can think of, there's probably an anonymous studio player working in film who blows them out of the water because they just have to do it every day, all day. And the, the, the stuff you hear from these guys is astonishing. Um, what these guys can do and what they can do on, on a dime. You know, if you ask them to play in a different style and they can do it on a dime brilliantly, it's, it's, they're an amazing bunch. Well, I have to ask before I turn the uh, questions over to the audience, uh, a movie question since I'm the movie guy. And there's a song on the album uh, called Snow, which is from White Christmas and is sung by Bing Crosby, by Danny Kaye, by Rosemary Clooney, Rosemary Clooney. and Vera Ellen. Yep. Four people. Yep. But Seth does it all by himself. He just... <laughs> He's all of those. Well, she, well, Rosemary Clooney did do a recording of that song, song. solo. She did. At one point, yeah. yeah. And so that's your excuse for that. That's my excuse. But yeah. in the movie White Christmas, no. It's the four of them, It's, yeah. just, it's that just the four of them doing it. On the like, train. That's on the train, yes. So was that what inspired you? You had seen that movie, even though we know you hate Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah it's... it's we, we, again, we like to do songs that are... That, where we where there's no cheating, you know, you, you can't kind of slip into Sinatra's version because you know, if you sing White Christmas, you can't, you can't, at least for me, I kind of can't help but slip into the cadences of Crosby because I've heard it so many times. And Snow is a song that, that you, there's no cheat sheet for that. You just have to kind of do it fresh and particularly with the arrangement that Joel wrote, which is a brand new arrangement. Um, and has so much life to it. it you, there, there's no you can't you can't lean on anything, which is half the fun. Yeah, and and Seth had the idea of taking this song, which is almost always done as a kind, uh, kind of a medium bouncy song, and he said let's 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 amp this up and do it really fast, like a super fast up tempo number. I don't know that there's another arrangement of snow that's done. You know, it's fast. I don't think people know that song. They see White Christmas every year on TV, but that's not the one they remember. And so I congratulate you for doing that. Even though you will go occasionally back to the perennial, there's a lot on this CD that doesn't do that. And it's, 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 a, it's a balance. I mean, the pe there's also the reality that people like to hear songs that they know. Um, and it's more fun to find obscurities and, make, and, and, and reinvent them. So it, it is a balance. I mean, there's stuff that's... You know, there, there, there's there's a mix of it, this album probably leans more heavily towards the forgotten chestnuts, but there's a little of both. Yeah, there there was a few songs I'd never even heard before. Like, like that, um, I become the guy who uses Christmas. that word. Yeah, <laughs> like uh, everybody's waiting for the man with the bag. I'd I'd never heard that song before. And that was something that came from your life that you you wanted to put on this CD. You're waiting for a man with a bag, really. Okay, that's, I'm, that's half my weekend, weekend pal. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't even want to go there. I think it's Waiting time. Waiting for the man with the bag. Bag. Yeah, it's time for the audience to speak. I usually have to go to his place, though. Yeah, I didn't mean to take you there. I was feeling <laughs> snow. I was feeling it. It's like taking your life in your, in hands, your hands. That part of town. It genuinely is. Okay, audience, it's your turn to seize the day. Hi, how's it going? A uh, big fan. Uh, two questions. First, uh, what's another type of genre of music you might want to work on, and can you please say Cool Whip? 
<laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> all right, first of all, Cool Whip. I'll bark like a seal. You want me to bark like a seal? Um, I mean, gosh, you know, I, that, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, you do have to know your limitations. I, I wouldn't ever try to do, you know, like a metal album. <laughs> I don't think I'd be very good at it. Um, there, there are some, there are some kind of great Sinatra recordings where he did kind of make that leap, and some of them work, and some of them are are just misfires, but they're 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 all interesting because they they kind of uh, indicate that how, how however well you fit in one genre when you do try to make that leap, oftentimes it, it can be just a total square peg in a round hole. There's a Sinatra recording of Downtown, the Petula Clark song, <clears throat> which is fantastically hilarious because he does this thing in the middle where he goes downtown, oh, downtown, oh, down. It's it's the strangest thing you've ever heard, <laughs> and and you know so I, I I think the the point is that if know your limitations, Truman. Hi, uh, my question is for Joel. So when you were coming up with the arrangements for all these songs, um, I'm just wondering if you can talk about finding the balance between modernizing them and tailoring them for a more modern audience and keeping them true to their original versions. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I didn't think about, in fact, the opposite. I, I, I wanted to not have any kind of modern aspect to it. Um, those aspects primarily come in terms of harmony. There are certain harmonies that... Uh, if I were to going into the 60s and 70s style of arranging, I would allow myself to use those harmonies, but I restricted myself from using certain harmonies, certain chord voicings, which might read a little more modern. Um, I, you know, I just felt like, as I, as I said, the palette that was established was one from the 40s and 50s, and, and uh, so I was very careful not to hopefully break out of that. Hi, um, I just want to first say you're incredibly talented. Um, and so I have two questions. Oh, both of you are incredibly talented. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so first, was there any song in particular that um, you had real trouble getting through without making a mistake and had to record over and over again? Um, and second, have you considered moving into, you know, working on Broadway or writing your own musical or something? I mean, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> I mean, the first question, um, you know, I mean, Man with the Bag was probably the most challenging. Everybody's waiting for the Man with the Bag because it is, it, 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 there's a lot going on in that song. Um, it's, it's a pretty fast moving tune and, and, you know, you got to race through it while at the same time showing colors. Um, and, you know, but but again, Joel Joel writes arrangements that are just infectious. You hear them, and they they just kind of get your energy going, which is you know there's something to be said for a great orchestration. What it does for your vocal, it does a lot. Um, and as far as a Broadway show, yeah, I mean, I you know we've talked about it. I've considered it. It 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 takes a certain amount of time. I love writing. So you know, we we wrote a song for. Uh, Amanda Seyfried that she sings in Ted 2 that uh, that we love that that she sounds great singing it and that, and that was a blast you know to write music for for somebody and and um, that was with Walter Murphy who writes music for Family Guy and it was you know it was fun yeah I'd love to do that at some point it's, it takes a good year or two of your life I think to commit to it so it would have to be when Ted 2 is done but maybe Hi, Seth. Hey, um, is that your question? No, I just want to say hi, and that I'm a really big fan. And what's your favorite Family Guy episode? I, I don't know where the hell you are. Oh, there you are. Okay, all right. Um, you're, not, you're not large, are you? Um, you really can't see. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't it's see a great. damn thing. Uh, my favorite Family Guy episode is, this is going to be a disappointment to you, it's, it's, um, it's probably the uh, Agatha Christie clue episode that we Wait, did. Wait, that's my favorite episode. Oh my God, let's get married. Hello. 
Um, yeah, no, I just want to know what kind of freaks you out, like, besides that voice. <laughs> Uh, like in <laughs> All right, we, day we day found day, the uh, weed guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have so many different um, genres of like what you what you do. You're a director, you're a writer, you animate. I mean, like, what do you find most uh, fulfilling to you in the day to day that you? I don't know. You work at a lot of different things. I mean, help me out here. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Is my question not clear? <laughs> What freaks me out, or, or and and what what do I, I mean? God, I mean, this kind of stuff is the most fulfilling. Like that, when when I'm in the studio and with an orchestra, and working with somebody like Joel, that's probably when I'm enjoying myself the most. Um, I mean, I, I was, I was probably the most freaked out in at any point in my career, right before I did. Uh, a million ways to die in the West. That was when I was the most scared because it was it was such an undertaking, and 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 at the same time, it's 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 that's when I kind of feel the most invigorated when I'm doing something that is that's new and scary. And you know, I don't go skydiving, I don't bungee jump. So in lieu of that, you know, I I do this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah. So since we're getting weird with it, with the questions, I figured I'd just kind of roll with that. So the last time, um, the last time I saw you, Seth, you were at Harvard receiving the oh, Humanist there you of the are. Year. Hi. <laughs> so did you go to Harvard? Um, I, I did research there. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. A anyone who has anything to do with Harvard, it always takes them like twenty seconds yeah. <laughs> before they bring it up. No. No. Forget it. No. There's, there's no real there's question, is there, ma'am? No. So, <laughs> So last time I saw you there, um, I told my dad, who is a huge fan of yours, that uh, I saw you receive the award, which, by the way, your acceptance speech was, like, awesome. I, you don't need me to tell you that, but it was awesome. And um, no, I need constant validation. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to What did you do your research? What did you do? What were you researching at Harvard? Um, so I uh, developed treatment protocols to test for uh, basically treating people with severe mental illness. Yeah, That's what I do. Yeah, now I do it here. Yeah. Well. Yeah, just to bring the mood down. A I make bit. shit jokes on TV. <laughs> Your mood. And a record. No. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Seth. Hey, Joel. I just have a quick question. So, which one of you picked the cover art? <laughs> and is that your good side? I don't know. You know, we, we, we tried a lot of options, and this, this felt like the kind of thing that was fit with the arrangements. You know, the arrangements are all like. Fuck you, it's Christmas. <laughs> you know, the orchestra is going to have fun. We're going to have fun. Everybody's going to be happy. And, and it's going to feel authentic and, and lush and, and warm. And, and you know, it, it, was, it was a gamble. But, <laughs> but it, at the end of the day, it, it, was, it was an honest gamble. And it, it felt like something that fit, fit with the... Um, uh, fit, fit, it, was, it, was, it was my idea, is the, is the <laughs> short version. Um, and it's a painting, by uh, Matthew Peake. Um, so it's not just Photoshop or anything. It was, it was a five by five painting. Huge. And again, you know, we, it's, it, 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 it's the same, uh, it all, all goes hand in hand with our, our uh, practice of doing it the way they did it 50 years ago. If you look at the old Sinatra albums or Nat King Cole albums, they're, they're paintings in a lot of cases. They're interpretations and, and so, I forget what the hell. <laughs> It's a tribute. It is. It's an homage to all of that. Now, I don't know what we all just did here, but I know that we all thank you, Joel and Seth, for being thank here. You, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Peter Travers. Thank you. Guys. The brilliant Joel McNeely. Brilliant Seth McFarland. It's, so we, we, we picked a few songs that you know, people will know, and then some other songs that, that are kind of undiscovered gems, we hope. And that's half the fun, is, is, is ideally being the first person in, in, in years to try and interpret something that's been forgotten and to reinvent it. What's one of those songs that are forgotten? I, on Christmas Dreaming, I know it's one of them. Well, that was one that you found. Christmas Dreaming. Yeah, Christmas Dreaming is a really obscure song. In fact, we could only find one recording of it, which was Sinatra, right? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that guy. Yeah. So but I mean, would know? it was a very early. Yeah. It was a very early recording, and I don't. I, I don't. I'm not aware that 
that anybody else has recorded. Or I'm sure they have, but we couldn't find it. Well, I think we should hear one of the songs. What was it that you would like to hear right now? I don't know. You know, I said you could pick them. I don't, I don't give right. a shit. All right, well, I want to start because it's... Yeah, I'll just pick them, even ones that aren't on the album. You know, I'll just say... You, know, you can play whatever it, you want. You know, I noticed that this album does not have a lot of... You can play the, the Carpenter's songs. Top of the World if you want right now. I'm not going to stop you. How did you know I was... <laughs> Do you, you, no, actually like, you actually it. like the Carpenters? No, I, I love the Carpenters. Carpenters. See, there's a confessions tonight that you're hearing all of this. No, I would be, for my own odd, bizarre, twisted reasons, I would like to hear a little of uh, Baby It's Cold Outside. Sure. That you duet with Sarah Bareilles. With Sarah Bareilles, yes. yeah. yeah. In fact, we're doing it live right now at the uh, Christmas tree lighting. <laughs> Which How's that going? Really, a bit of scheduling. Wow. Oh, good. <laughs> That's Can set your DVRs. Yes, Peter, you can only stare into my eyes for so long while this is happening. Just like my mother ice. will start to worry. Just three guys What's sitting on a stage, silently listening to Christmas music. To the and there's so nothing I wrong with that. Don't hurry. Any, anyway, <laughs> you know they get to go home tomorrow so they're in a relaxed mellow mood you know you, you don't get to go home i get to go home but i live here do you not want to go home is there, is there trouble at home you pe never in new york there's this only good if you if you go and watch the lighting of the tree tonight you will be pummeled and pushed and you know at all since you did arrange everything are there points during the process where he says who the hell came up with this i can't sing this we have those moments yeah. ahead of time. I, see. I do these arrangements, and we, we figure these things out together. Um, we come up, a lot of times he'll come up with a concept for a tempo or a style for the song. Um, and then in the case of Melakaliki Maka, which is, I, my day job is film music, and uh, I was writing this arrangement, and I just had this kind of daydream about walking through a jungle Everything's murky and creepy, and suddenly you come into a clearing, and there's a, this luau going on with all these people bouncing around in the <laughs> in the grass skirts and whatnot. And so I made that a, a part of the story of the arrangement. You, you hear that story in, in the arrangement. It makes no sense whatsoever, other uh, other other than it amused me while I was well, working. Uh, so and, and, and pa part part of it too is connecting. You know, we're, we also start on the same page. So part of it is, is, you know, it's like a casting process. It's like you want to be working with someone who's already, who already kind of gets the things already that you get. Who already knows your craziness. And, you know, as, as Joel and I have talked about, you know, we live in an age where everything has to be mocked up with a synthesizer for the producer to hear. And, and Joel wrote this amazing score for A Million Ways to Die in the West. And, you know, we, again, we did it the old-fashioned way where he gets the film, he writes the music, and then... We go and we hear it with the orchestra the first time when it's being recorded. So you can't, you know, which is unprecedented. And... Doesn't happen anymore. The level of trust, you know, um, just allowing a composer to write. He says, "I trust you. I'll hear it at the session." That never happens, and it was very freeing. Very freeing as a composer. I, I bet it would be, and it, it's also liberating when you. Well, we should hear it. We should hear a little bit of Melikaliki Maka, especially with Joel's very strange daydreams. <laughs> so that we can experience them with you in the room. If, if you listen to Joel's instrumental break in the middle, it's what we're talking about. Yeah, this, yeah. I was thinking of a guy tapped in. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. That's not going to happen tonight. But we thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to introduce Seth McFarland and Joe McNeely. <laughs> Who got the idea that they were so in love with Christmas? And how drunk was one of <laughs> <laughs> I I got really liquored up and yeah. converted to Christianity and then sobered up and it went away. Um, I uh, you know, we, we had done we had done the first album, Music is Better Than Words, and um, the the record label suggested, hey, you know, if you want to do another one of these a Christmas record might be a good fit, and it was something that hadn't occurred to either of us, I think. 
Um, but it, it, it seemed like thematically something that might be kind of fun, so we ran with it, and this is what we came up with. So it was, it was kind of a mutual thing, or which one of you, did you go to Joel and say, yeah, come on, we'll do it? Or did he come to you and say, we need to do it? I don't remember, do you? No, so neither of us a, remember. There was a lot of alcohol involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, but it turned out so well. So that's... We, okay. we were happy. We're happy the way it turned out. Yeah. yeah. So the reason behind it is that you're in love with those songs or you're in love with something else behind the songs? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, you, you have to speak for yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, an avid fan of Christmas music necessarily. Scrooge McFarland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah. Well. It's just, it was just me and my cat this year, man. But, um, but I, I do, you know, I love the, the genre of orchestral jazz, which is so closely linked to so much Christmas music. Um, so it, it, it was not a big leap. Um, but we, you know, we, we did try to pick stuff that was not quite as done as, uh, as albums that we've, we've heard before. You know, we, we've heard White Christmas and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and these songs a thousand times before. It's like singing Come Fly With Me. You're not going to do it better than Sinatra, so why try? Um, All kinds of non-Christmassy things. Um, what was the question? I don't remember. I know there was a big call for Melakaliki Maka, oh, which right, is yeah. the Hawaiian way the Hawaiian to Christmas say song. Merry Christmas yeah. to you. Joel, was I musical when I said that? This is, by the way, this is a great... The, 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 I, I say this often. The art of orchestration is something that is, is vanishing or vanished. And by, by that I mean, <clears throat> if you listen to a Sinatra song, because nobody had better arrangers than he did, and you pull the vocals out of that, you still hear this awesome orchestral track. There's a lot going on with the orchestra, and, and that's become something that's very dull nowadays. And one of the things that Joel is, can do, and I think he's one of like five guys left who can do it, is really command an orchestra so that there's fun... There's jokes in the arrangements. There's fun stuff going on. He's got a Hawaiian guitar in there. And that's, that's something that I would love to hear more of, and, and we just don't get enough of it. So this is a good example of that done well by this guy. Well, we should say, too, that you recorded this live with the orchestra. This isn't done. And you were with real human breathing musicians? Well, we did it. It's the second album that we've done that way. Yeah, real actually. Yeah, yeah with about 60 musicians. And we, we wanted to do it the way that they did it 50 years ago, where your prep is done before you record and not in post-production, where you'd spend three days recording the album. What you do in the studio is what's on the record. You, you, you do it with the orchestra, so everyone is in the same room, breathing the same air, and, and you kind of feed off of each other. And it just makes a huge difference. Yeah, and there's, there's no isolation, right? There's nobody in a booth. The drums are sitting next to the violin, so everything's leaking in all the mics, which is a part of the old sound. One thing I wanted to say about the recording of this, though, is it was done in uh, Abbey Road Studios in London, in Studio 2, which is, for me, holy ground. You genuflect when you walk through those doors, because that's where about 95% of all the Beatles songs were recorded, and the room has not changed since the, the days that the Beatles recorded there. So it's a very special place. The vibe is really, really great. So because you're dealing with Seth while this is happening, is he dictatorial when he's in there, or does he listen to you? Dancing? There's a lot going on. A lot going on there, and that's it's just like it's just it's just kind of a ballsy, fun <clears throat> sound that you don't hear anymore. And again, he's he's awesome, this guy. He is, but this is also called holiday for swing, and it does. It has a real. You, I don't expect to hear that kind of arrangement on this, which is what's so refreshing about it. You get to you really hear that. Yeah, well, you hear. I mean, if if you listen to the to the capital arrangements. 
on the old Sinatra records, you're hearing xylophones. You're hearing stuff that's light and and buoyant and and you know, it, it kind of mixes itself. Um, and and it, it's it's fun. It's fun stuff. It's like not afraid to be funny and whimsical at times. And and I think that's what you don't see a lot of now. And touching. Now, Joe, when at what point did you cry hearing him sing? <laughs> Well, that's kind of between me and him. I know, you don't. <laughs> and I know it yeah, happened. No, I, mean, I want to. I want to kind of comment on what Seth just said about the, these arrangements. What the fun thing is is that we're both starting from the same point of a love for this this music of that time. And Seth is a real connoisseur. Really knows the music, um, knows it better than I do for sure. And so we're already kind of. This is the pool we're going to swim in. These, the, these are the colors we're going to use. That's, we were both in the pool. That's when you cried. Yes. Uh. <laughs> and, um, and, and so it just makes it easy because we know what the confines are. And, and he's a very knowledgeable dude about this music. But it sounds like you two are having the really best time in, <laughs> in Abbey Road doing this. And... How do you separate yourself from having this good time to listening back 